Okay, cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our um, BMG seminar series, um, which uh, takes place, as you noticed, virtually. Um, I will, before, uh, yeah. So I, we are very honored to uh, host this uh, seminar, Dr. Ilan Levy. Ilan has his Bachelor of in Geology from uh, Ben Gurion University that has completed in 2012. He completed his Master and PhD on the geochemical history of the Dead Sea brine derived from pore fluids in deep drilled cores, which pr project actually he will present in this talk. The PhD was under the <clears throat> supervision of Professor Ritz Ivan from Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Professor Yosef Yechieli, and Dr. Iktai Gabrieli from the Geological Survey of Israel. During his master and PhD, he received a number of awards, including the Dr. Dr. Asaf Gur Award for Excellence in PhD Research from Ben Gurion University. He continued briefly as a postdoctoral fellow at the Geological Survey of Israel until uh, early uh, 2019, and during the later part of 2019, began a postdoctoral science position at the Max Planck Institute, Institute for Chemistry in Mainz, Germany, in place that actually he resides today and from where he is talking. Ilan is currently a postdoc fellow uh, of the Minerva Stiftung in Climate Geochemistry Department and is uh, researching the reconstruction of Eastern Mediterranean climate from fluid inclusions in cave pelotem. Since 2015, he has authored and co-authored scientific papers in reputable uh, earth science journals, including Geology, EPSL, and Quaternary Quater Science Reviews. Before we start, I will remind everybody that um, uh, the talk is recorded and it will be uploaded to the web and um, that uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. So they are basically stored inside until we finish the talk or just um, ask them directly at the end of the talk. Okay, so Ilan, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that introduction. Um, I don't have really much to add for the, for the title of the page. You, you get an idea. This is basically uh, work that I undertook during my PhD. Uh, I finished last year and Zorit Sivan was my primary advisor from Ben Gurion University. If I just move forward, oh, can I move forward like this? How do I do that? Okay, oh, okay. Right. Okay, so, excuse me. Okay, so a little bit background on the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a hypersaline lake. It has extremely high quantities of dissolved solutes, which makes it extremely dense and viscose. Its composition is mainly comprised of chloride, magnesium, sodium, and calcium. Oh, sorry. And uh, this makes the brine extremely susceptible to precipitate minerals. The, the main minerals we see today are halite. If you're lucky enough to go to the Dead Sea beaches, in the recent years, you may have seen halite around the, 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 the exposed on the beach, on the flat beaches, um, which are derived from the lake itself. If you're around in the 1950s and 60s, perhaps you would see a similar mineral, but uh, um, which was white, but wasn't halite, it was gypsum. Today, the brine is actually super saturated with respect to gypsum but kinetic factors prevent it from precipitating. The transition from a gypsum precipitating lake to a halite precipitating lake actually uh, coincided as well with a limnological transition from one where the Dead Sea was a stratified lake, so it was, it was meromictic, 
where we had um, very uh, stable conditions where the deep, dense hypolimnium waters were capped by a less dense surface epilimnium, uh, not surface waters, but uh, uh, an upper water column that was less dense. During the late 70s, there was an overturn of this lake and holomictic conditions uh, became uh, more, uh, basically started and, and became more abundant over time, where we have homogeneous lake uh, water column conditions. Um, and this was caused um, as a result of ongoing lake level decrease throughout the 20th century. Dead Sea is a terminal lake and its large watershed, which spans from north to south, uh, actually it uh, records uh, climates where Mediterranean climate in the north is the most dominating um, system, climate system, uh, that um, basically uh, has, has, uh, has affects the, the lake levels. Indeed, if we go back and look at changing lake levels over geological time, we see that um, large fluctuations occur with the Holocene mainly around minus 400 meters below sea level, median sea level. However, during the last glacial period, we have lake levels in excess of 100, hundreds of meters um, for comparison. And we can use these lake levels to reconstruct regional climate variability on geological time scales. In addition to lake levels, we can also learn quite a lot about the, 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 the changing um, lake composition and um, as a result of climate from um, the, the evaporite sediments that make up the Dead Sea sedimentological record. We find mainly gypsum and aragonite around the marginal terraces, while halite is mainly deposited in the, 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 the large basin. Okay. And from a chemical perspective, if we look at the Dead Sea brine, we know that there are, there are quite a few factors which control the, its, its composition. The main one is hydroclimate effects. We have these hydroclimate effects in, in the watershed, which directly concentrate. If we have negative water, water balance, for example, the brine is concentrated and or diluted perhaps when we have excess or, or, or increased precipitation in the watershed. We can have a secondary process where we have precipitation of primary evaporite deposits. We have contribution of solids from external sources, such as the rivers, um, but also from springs, hydro hydrothermal springs or, 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 or other groundwaters. Um, and uh, dissolution of evaporites can also contribute solids to the, to the lake. We, have, uh, we always have to take into consideration the linological structure of the lake. If we uh, today, see holomictic conditions. They're not necessarily these. These occurred in the past, and we, and we know that uh, the lake is prone to to having a meromictic type stratification, with uh, which means that it may have two types of compositions or even more. And if we have a stratified lake, we may also have anoxic uh, conditions in a deeper water column, which would then result in anaerobic microbial processes in the lake water column. So until now reconstructing uh, dead or, or investigating Dead Sea composition was mainly based on ge geochemical proxies from exposed evaporite deposits at marginal terraces until the Dead Sea deep drilling project. And in late 2010 to 2011, and underneath uh, uh, an international initiative with Israeli scientists and international scientists and the ICDP, a series of cores were, were uh, drilled and, and caught and, and extracted from the northern lake. And one of the more famous cores, core 5071A, 
which was taken from the deep basin. And at a water level or water column level three hundred meters, actually contains the same sediments which we find at the marginal terraces and even more. We find more highlights than at the margins. We find more gypsum, and we do, we have alternating aragonite and detritus deposits, but we also have more fine detritus material. Uh, in this core, typical of deep uh, basin uh, detritus, fine detritus material that is usually found in these settings. Indeed, the core itself is 455 meters um, deep, long and um, it spans around 200,000 years. I was very lucky to be given the opportunity to actually join and, and during my masters I, 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 I had the opportunity to join and investigate the pore fluid compositions from these cores and uh, the idea is that especially for core 5071 core 5071a um, we can use the composition of the pore fluid to reconstruct deep hyperlinear compositions as they are a direct remnant of water at the sediment water interface And so that was my main PhD goal. And in essence, I, I, all the factors I discussed with you earlier, um, I tried to develop and, and, and push through during my PhD. And we published a few papers on the way, some, some nice studies, and hopefully I'll be able to present uh, the, the, the general um, today, I'll hopefully be able to present to you um, some key, key, key findings. Right, so the methods employed at the time uh, we, of the drilling was to take sediment from the core catcher material. And in the drilling apparatus on board on the vessel, the, this, this, this sediment was basically drilled using this kind of drill bit here. And in this drill bit, or we have the core catcher. The core catcher prevents the sediment from, from dropping out when it's extracted from the ground. And the sediments at the core catches are tend to be uh, slightly deformed, but for 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 free fall analyzing pore fluid, it's it's actually it's fine. We don't we're not interested in in the, in uh, the deformities of the sediment. It's 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 not what we're looking at. So it's it's good material to use for for, for pore fluids. Additionally, sediment samples were taken from core sections. This was also to 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 gain an understanding and, and to uh, validate the use of the core catcher material to see if the concentrations and ions depths are fine, but also to build a high resolution, uh, better resolution record. Fluid is then extracted and chemical and isotope analyses are then carried out. And what I'm showing you now are these profiles of the, that we measured from core 5071A. And without really focusing on anything, I just really want to highlight or, or, or to emphasize that we have significant variability in these profiles. And even though we're talking about coral that's around five, 450 meters uh, below the ground, we still see a lot of variability here, which is quite unique because uh, especially when dealing with pore fluids, we tend to see that as you go deeper into the ground, the 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 the, the the concentrations um, become homogenized. And this is due to diffusion and infection, which reworks solid concentrations in the ground, especially for major ions. In the marine world, um, we can, you can, we, well, in any system, you can sort of model um, these processes which are occurring in the subsurface uh, using this mat mathematical type of equation where you see you 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 can um, investigate the concentration of a certain solute as a function of time if you have the gradient and uh, you know the diffusion co uh, co constant and virtual vert vertical advection component. Um, typically, you would want to, uh, an ion or or, or a, a solute which is conservative in the subsurface. So for seawater, chloride is fine. It's the most abundant uh, major ion. 
And uh, this is exactly what, uh, in this work by Atkins and Schrag, they uh, modeled and investigated diffusion and infection in the subsurface based, based on, these, on these results. You can see the model results by the lines. Um, in the Dead Sea, it's not so, oh, in the Dead Sea, it's not so, uh, um, it's not so clear if chloride can be used. In fact, chloride is, is not a conservative element in the Dead Sea during evaporation. It's better to use something like magnesium or bromide. Magnesium and bromide are conservative. That is, they, they do not react during evaporation until up to a certain degree, of course, but um, the, 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 the relative changes in concentration throughout the pore, in the pore fluids are, are, are kept. And we know this because the, the, the ratio is relatively uniform over the entire core depth. Thus, we can investigate magnesium and bromide um, from, uh, we can investigate the diffusion of action using magnesium or bromide. And luckily, when I was uh, doing my uh, master's and PhD, I uh, had the opportunity to, to, to collaborate or talk to other geochemists who were working on the sediments of the core. Yel Kio, who was working on the composition of uh, fluid inclusions in highlight crystals found in, at different depths along the, on, along the core. And what she found was that the magnesium concentrations of these highlight fluid inclusions actually correlate very well to the magnesium concentrations of the pore fluids from similar depths. As you can see from uh, the, these green points as, as opposed to the red points. What this may suggest, uh, what this suggests basically, is that at least in these intervals where we have a lot of halides, we have limited uh, subsurface transport. That is, infection and diffusion are kind of limited here. Furthermore, if we look in, at an interval which isn't, which is sandwiched in between, which corresponds to the last glacial period, where we don't have any highlight, we can compare pore fluid um, oxygen isotopes of, of the water to that of the aragonite in the core. And um, as you can see in blue, we have a lot of fluctuations. This is from the aragonite, the blue. And in red, we have the pore fluids. But we see that both show a general enrichment with increasing uh, depth. This suggests that the pore fluids, even here, haven't been significantly reworked. Nevertheless, we did carry out some diffusion modeling experiments to, to assess well, how much reworking has had, 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 underwent, had been gone, undergone in the sediments. What we found was that the high dynamic viscosity of the brine actually um, has, uh, it basically uh, affects the diffusion coefficient, it reduces it. And this, hump is, this is expressed in, these, in, the, in the preservation of the trends, of the concentration trends in the core. So then we can take magnesium or bromide and look at it as a time series, as it is. Right? We, we, we are very... Um, we don't need to be that cautious uh, when we come to conclusions, especially for the, when we're investigating long-term trends here. So what I'm showing you now is magnesium as a time series, okay? And I just want to highlight a few, a few uh, important, important uh, features here. Firstly, we see increasing concentrations during interglacial periods, during penultimate interglacial, last interglacial, and the Holocene as opposed to decreasing concentration during the, during the glacial periods. What this suggests is that we have an interglacial glacial pattern, which is, which is, is uh, the dominating uh, factor controlling concentrations on these timescales. And that climate, as opposed to inventory changes, is, is the primary uh, factor altering the magnesium concentrations over, over geological time. This means that it's proportional 
to deep lake net water balance changes and could be proportional to lake, lake volume. Well, what's great about the magnesium profile of this magnesium time series is that it correlates extremely well with other global climate archives. One of the more famous ones is the um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations from Antarctic ice cores. You can see this glacial interglacial pattern very clearly and the similarity is quite uh, unique and fascinating. I really want to kind of um, 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 express that uh, global climate alone isn't the, the only factor um, controlling magnesium or bromide concentrations. We actually see evidence for regional climate events which aren't expressed in global climate records. Two particular events which, are, which date, one to the early Holocene and one to the last interglacial period, they are found in these halite-rich intervals in the core and are, are, what we see here are diluted concentrations of both magnesium and bromide in comparison to preceding and, and succeeding concentrations. So we see a decrease of, of magnesium bromide concentrations here. Interestingly, these, these time intervals correspond to the deposition of Mediterranean saprobellales, S, S, S1 and S5. If you remember, Mediterranean saprobellales or layers are organic rich sediments in the Mediterranean Sea. However, more importantly, I think, is that they, 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 they correlate well with regional climate records. The iconic Sorek Cave Speleothem record shows very clearly that during the period where we have Sapropel 1 and Sapropel 5, we have an anomaly of the Delta C13 isotopes, where we have increased or enrichment of, of, of 13C. Um, suggested to be the result of flooding uh, events, which then dissolved the bedrock, overlying bedrock over the caves. We also see evidence during the period corresponding to S5 of uh, uh, spelothem travertine deposits, negative desert. So this kind of uh, wraps up the magnesium and the bromide. We, these concentrations are controlled by both regional and global climate. And that's the paper we published a few years ago. I want to continue and basically talk about processes which occur in the lake, what we can learn about um, from, and after, after we have this foundation for magnesium and for understanding the diffusion and, 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 uh, and convection in the subsurface, so this, this um, uh, this can now be advanced to understand or reconstructing paleolimnological paleo processes. If you remember, I showed you a slide where we where, where magnesium was uh, a ratio with bromide. We saw that it's, it's uniform over an entire core depth. Well, that's not the case for sodium to chloride. Sodium chloride, um, sodium to chloride isn't a, a uniform ratio. It changes over the depth, and interestingly, we see uh, <clears throat> a split, uh, almost a mirror image of the magnesium concentrations. So, what's going on here? Well, in the Dead Sea, sodium to chloride ratio is actually a proxy for halide precipitation and dissolution. The reason being such: firstly, we have um, in quantity, we have less sodium as, as opposed to chloride. What this means is that our starting ratio, brine ratio, is, is, uh, is a fraction below one. If we precipitate halite, halite is precipitated out as a, as at, a, at a ratio of one to one, then our residual brine will actually decrease in the sodium chloride ratio. Correspondingly, if we, and comparatively, if we dissolve halides, our sodium to chloride ratio will increase. So if we go back to our magnesium time series record and sodium to chloride time series record, I just want to focus on two specific parts, 
from the last integration of the Holocene. Here we see an ongoing increase in magnesium concentrations, which would uh, symbolize or represent the ongoing lake level drop over this time over these time intervals and concentration of the brine. At the same time, we see a decrease in the sodium to chloride ratio, uh, symbolizing the, the, the precipitation of halite and the, the change in, in, in the inventories of sodium and chloride over time. In the core itself, we have this evidence. So we see a lot of halite layers over this same time interval. So together, the sediments and the pore fluids are showing the same thing. If we look at the, 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 intermittent, the intermediate interval of the, of the last extended last glacial period, we have around 100,000 years of dilution, or generally of dilution of magnesium, while the sodium chloride ratio increases at the same time, which would suggest that we have dissolution of sodium uh, of sodium chloride mineral out of halite. We can actually quantify how much halite has, has dissolved um, based along the, the proportion, proportional um, aspects where, when assuming that magnesium concentration change are proportional to lake volume metric changes. So we can calculate the amount of sodium and chloride uh, added to the brine over this time interval. We see a whopping 380% for sodium and 70% for chloride. We can also calculate a rate of enrichment. And I'd like to thank Nicolas here because as a student, I um, presented this as a poster at the annual uh, IGS conference. And Nicolas, he uh, he saw the poster and he came and asked a very good question, which was, where did the salt come from? And that question then took me on a journey um, and really, uh, really got me thinking about things a little bit differently. Luckily, I didn't need to look far because situated at the southern, uh, south southwest part of the Dead Sea, we have a mountain of salt called Mount Stom. Mount Stom is uh, basically a salt diaper. It's a mountain of salt that's being extruded, it's extruding, uh, coming out of the ground. I like this cross section here by a French geologist called uh, Louis Lante. He is famous actually because he discovered the Cro-Magnon uh, remains of the early human, oil, human remains in France. And he drew very nicely in one of his expeditions in the 19th century. The, he, had a cross, he drew a cross section of the Dead Sea, of the Southern Dead Sea Basin, when it was connected to the, to the Northern Basin. And you can see here, they, they had sailing ships at the time. And uh, Mount Stom. And he clearly, as a geologist, he could, he could pick apart what's, on, what's going on in this mountain. He noticed that we have salt and we have a gypsum, which is uh, not really gypsum, but it's anhydrite we know today. And we also have ancient deposits of the lake, um, which uh, on top of the mountain, which which suggests that 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 uh, this type was actually submerged at some point below the lake. Indeed, if we look at the the, the from this picture from this from this sketch here, we can see very clearly that the lake comes right up to uh, the, the, the boundaries of this type of salt type. Okay, a few facts about Mount Stom. It measures around 10 kilometers north to south and two kilometers wide. And we can, we know, we can, we know basically um, what the uplift rates are. Uh, today uh, from geophysical measurements and that that that's between three to ten millimeters per year perhaps even more based on recent studies we also have a lot of information uh, from the geology 
that there was extensive dissolution of this rock salt. We have a cap rock, which is around 40 meters thickness. And this suggests that around 600 to 800 meters at least of rock salt had dissolved based on, on previous studies. We also know the composition. So we can even calculate how much rock salt was dissolved. And we can also calculate a rate based on the uplift rate of the DAP. Oh. What we find are very similar rates, very similar rates and total contribution of, of chloride and sodium to the lake over, over based on these estimates in comparison to the pore fluid estimates. This supports uh, the idea that, that Mount Storm provided and was a primary source for sodium and chloride into Lake Lisan, into the last glacier of the lake. So we can also look at it from, an, from a stable isotope perspective. It's uh, here I'm showing you uh, in the x-axis, uh, sodium chloride ratio. So with increasing sodium chloride ratio, uh, we have increased halide dissolution. In the pore fluids, okay, um, at the start of the, 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 the last glacial and with ongoing uh, time. It's clear to see that we have an enrichment, 37 of the heavier isotope, of the rare isotope, 37 chlor chloride 37, with time. And this would suggest that we, 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 we have the solution of halite. In fact, Mount Storm has heterogeneous uh, uh, isotope compositions. However, it's mainly, uh, mainly it's suitable, uh, suiting this, this, the idea that perhaps dissolution of rock salt um, causes enrichment. Okay, so to simplify um, the findings so far, you have to remember we were investigating pore fluids from the deepest part of the, de of the Dead Sea. So we're, we're looking at compositional changes here. Mount Storm sits at the marginal terraces, and we know that during the last glacial, that's uh, Lake Lisan, uh, water levels were in excess of Mount Storm, and highlight dissolution was occurring. Basically, what's, um, what we believe is occurring here, based on the information we have, is that dissolution of, 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 the, of the diaper occurred, and then solutes were transported, or sodium chloride was transported to the deep lake. Following dissolution, this, the, the, the water becomes saline, hypersaline, more saline than the surrounding solution. And so it had the potential to, 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 to flow into the deep lake and mix with the deep hyperlimium. At the same time, this would cause simultaneous decrease in magnesium because we're diluting magnesium and increase in the sodium chloride ratio. And I can, from following that study, we can basically uh, continue and investigate other solutes. So uh, in this study, we, we looked at uh, the sulfate enrichment that we find in at, at the similar, similar sediments of the last glacial period. We see that there's a significant enrichment of sulfate in the upper parts of the last glacial uh, pore fluids. The question is, did the sulfate enrichment here result from dissolution of sulfate also bound to the storm evaporites? So we tend to think of Mount Storm as a salt diaper, and uh, perhaps we think of it as, as mainly sodium chloride, but actually it contains quite a lot of sulfate. We know that from a chemical analysis of uh, the, the rock salt, um, which have been done in the past, but also the cap rock itself is, is mostly anhydride composition. This suggests that a lot of the sulfate bound here um, would have is either insoluble, and, 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 but, 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 it, but it also suggests that during the solution of the rock salt, the solution likely became saturated with respect to either anhydrite or gypsum during this process. We can also calculate the, the ratio of sulfate to chloride on, on, in this diaper. We have a ratio of about one sulfate ion for every 20 chloride ions. 
Comparatively, if we look at the ongoing enrichment of sulfate in the last glacial or pore fluids, we see that over a span of 100,000 years, there is an enrichment of about one sulfate ion for every 70 chloride ions. Significantly more chloride is, is, is therefore added as opposed to sulfate. And if we assume that all the chloride comes from Mount Stone, then this, uh, th this suggests that, that there is enough sulfate on Mount Stone to, 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 uh, to, to account for this enrichment and also form the anhydride cap rock. I won't show you the equations here, but you have to trust me, they're in the paper. We can also look at it from a stable isotope perspective. And uh, the pore fluid sulfate in, in red shows stable isotopes which tend to overlap that of sulfate on Mount Stone for both sulfur and oxygen. So if we go back to our conceptual model of Lake Lisan, um, we can now adapt this and add sulfate as an additional parameter here that's being enriched in the deep lake, in addition to the dilution of magnesium and the increase of the sodium chloride ratio. In fact, the mass balance estimates and stabilize the jobs would suggest that. However, we have another piece of evidence which contradicts that, and that is the degree of saturation with respect to gypsum. Now, when the degree of saturation is one, we're basically at saturated states. When we're above one, we are supersaturated. And we can clearly see that there are pore fluids supersaturated with respect to gypsum in this, in this uh, uh, sediment interval. So what's going on here? Because we know that the solution cannot proceed beyond saturation. Perhaps this is a relic of mixing of the epilinium, sulfate-rich epilinium, with the calcium-rich hypolinium. If you take two solutions, one rich in calcium, but low in sulfate, so this would be representative of the hypolinium, and mix that, and we know that is saturated with respect to gypsum, and we mix up with a solution that's low in calcium, which is representative of the epilinium, the diluted epilinium, but also enriched in sulfate due to the dissolution of arenodrite. And we mix those two solutions together. We then receive a solution which is supersaturated with respect to gypsum. This is theoretical, but we can actually test this using geochemical modeling. We don't know the composition of the epilinium. We have to guess that, but we, can, we have a good idea what the composition of the hypolinium is. What we can do is create a series of solutions um, of epilinium composition. Okay, so an array of, of a bunch of solutions of, of, of uh, diluted uh, epilinium composition diluted respected hypolinium. So it has a little bit of the calcium chloride brine, but is also diluted. Then we can dissolve anhydrite until saturation, okay? And add halite in at a ratio of one to 70, uh, sulfate, sulfate to chloride. Following that, we can then calculate the solution density. And if the solution density is, is uh, in excess of what we see in the hypolimium, then we know that the water following the solution, based on our theoretical uh, modeling, can reach the deepest depths of the hypolimium and mix with hypolimium uh, solution. We also want to, uh, one of the conditions for the model is that we also receive concentrations of at le uh, reaching uh, at least 33 millimolar this is our maximum concentrations that we find in the, the pore fluids. We also want to see the, 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 the final solutions become super saturated with respect to gypsum following mixing. It seems a bit complicated, but I'll try and take you back and, and for a piece, piecewise, a step, step by step. Basically, we took uh, an initial uh, com uh, calcium chloride composition of the pore fluid, representative of the start of, of uh, um, the extended last glacial period. In this case, we, we used the, the, the pore fluid represented at 117,000 years. 
Then we diluted that to various degrees. We calculated the density and the sulfate concentrations, which you can see here. Then we dissolved using um, FreeQC uh, software. So this is all theoretical, it's, it's, it's done in the software. Uh, we dissolved anhydrite uh, to saturation. This increases the sulfate concentrations. We then dissolve halite. This increases the density. As you can see here from the results, we're very, we're very close to what we have in the pore fluids. So these are pore fluids. However, we started, we're still a little bit short. I would be a bit more happy with the results if they were in excess of what we see in the pore fluids. So it kind of got us thinking and we went back to, 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 to our textbooks and uh, the last parameter we can change here, uh, perhaps which, 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 is, which is important, is the temperature. So we had just assumed that uh, 25 degrees was uh, an, an, the temperature of, of, of the epilimium of Lake Sun. However, we are talking about the last glacial period, perhaps it was cooler. So then we repeated it for 15 degrees. And what we found was by reducing the temperature, we can actually dissolve much more anhydrite. And, and as a result of that, we can also add more halite. And we receive densities of the solution densities in excess of what we see in the last glacial period, at least for this part of the last glacial period. So yes, at least in so, at some points of the last glacial period, theoretically, based on our, our, our modeling, we could uh, dissolution of, of the Mernstrom diaper was able, and, and post-dissolution solutions, um, which were cooler, um, could then reach and cascade all the way down to the deepest parts of the deep Dead Sea and mix with the deepest, deepest epilimium waters. And this temperature-based temperature facilitate, facilitating mechanism, um, may be, uh, there may be further evidence for this um, when we look at sulfate as a time series. Interestingly, what we see is that peak sulfate concentrations are found at the, the, around 20,000 years ago. And this is actually uh, the last glacial maximum. The last glacial maximum was the cool was the, uh, the time for the coolest uh, parts of uh, glo globally. It was the coolest, especially in the northern hemisphere. We have maximum ice sheet expansion. So to see the sulfate maximum sulfate concentrations here is is supports this the, the notion that cool eponymic water was driving the solution of Mansdorf. Additionally, we also know that directly after the LGM, we have the thickest gypsum deposit. And, and this is from a, a geological perspective, we have the thickest gypsum deposit deposited directly following the LGM. So to summarize, subsurface transports of, of pore fluid solutes uh, was significantly hampered or, 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 or it was, it was, there, were, there was hardly any uh, or really limited uh, diffusion and infection, in, at least in large part, parts of the core. We have um, the effects of global and regional hydro, hydroclimate variability amplified in some records, such as magnesium and bromide. We have secondary processes, such as precipitation dissolution of highlight, and um, we suggest that dissolution of storm diaper evaporites was, was a primary source that buffered Lake Salinity during the last glacial period, as well as adding sulfate to the lake. And we suggest that we, we, we have evidence here of, for mixing of epilimium and hypolimium waters, which resulted in supersaturation with respect to gym, gypsum in the last glacial um, deep hypolimium. So paleoluminological configurations of the lake uh, could be re reconstructed here when we compared uh, pore fluid concentrations and their trends to the evaporite sediments and their proxies. And uh, of course, we added a little bit of additional geochemical modeling to that. 
So I want to stop here and just say to everyone, thank you for, for joining and, and listening and acknowledge all the people that were with me throughout uh, my master's and PhD um, from Ben Gurion University, the Geological Survey of Israel and the Hebrew University and other places. And, uh, and yeah, and the financial support that I received. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Ilan. Yep. This, is, this was really an enlightening uh, talk uh, with a lot of information. Um, so I, I, I open the podium for questions. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> your, your work is actually interesting, but I just need a brief or few clarification. In your sample, you said your, your sample, you try as much as possible to prevent your sample from oxidation. Yeah. So I want to know, was it, a, was it an absolute prevention from oxidation? If not, if there's a kind of a few oxidation with your sample, what is it going to affect from your results? And if it was a perfect prevention from oxidation, how are you able to achieve that? Right, so uh, that's a very good question. The core catcher material, which was taken during 2010 uh, and 11, was actually taken on the vessel itself, on the barge itself. And uh, great care was taken at the time to prevent oxidation. What I mean by that, is that the sediment was um, placed into uh, vials which had um, anaerobic headspace. Okay, so they were flushed with nitrogen or helium or, or uh, I think it was uh, not nitrogen, it was, it was uh, uh, helium. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, then the pore fluid was extracted using using the methods that Torizzi Banz lab in Beersheba for uh, determining um, um, for, for looking at and, and investigating uh, typically um, methane and and, uh, and proxies uh, which uh, which typically would be removed uh, during uh, during an oxidation process and the fact that we have uh, sulfides in those in those samples that we could take and extract, and, uh, and uh, methane uh, suggests that uh, it wasn't uh, oxidized, oxidized. So those samples are good. The core section material, which was taken at a later date, they were taken after the splicing of the core, okay? And the core sections, um, they, perhaps um, would have been exposed to some oxidation. Um, however, what we did was we, we, uh, we tried to take sediment, which was uh, mainly clay and find a trite material. And we scraped uh, off the upper uh, few millimeters of the sediment before actually extracting the pore fluid. Uh, during that process, we, we then, again, we measured uh, sulfate and we, um, we uh, looked at uh, a bunch of other DIC. Um, we didn't see any, uh, any, any, anything which would suggest there was significant oxidation there. Uh, that isn't to say that it, it didn't happen. Okay, uh, but we didn't see anything. In fact, we can actually look at the sulfate isotopes. Okay, I just want to show you sulfate isotopes. Oh, where are we? Here, okay. So the pore fluid sulfate actually doesn't uh, show any, anything which would suggest that we are, are altering this isotope composition uh, to, uh, to values which, which, which typically we see when, when oxidation of reduced sulfur species are oxidized, okay? 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ilan. Yeah, Ravital, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Excellent. Uh, although files of it I already heard before, it's always good to get the entire picture. I wonder if you try to, if it's okay to do a, uh, uh, to use your geochemical data to reconstruct the lake level. That, that is a good question. Uh, and it is something that we will do eventually, I think, or at least make a proper comparison between lake level and, uh, and uh, this geochemical data, definitely. There has to be something that's done. Um, these are two independent records. There is, there is some uh, discrepancies, so we can, um, we can see differences. They're there. Um, we don't expect a full uh, comparison. No, the, the, the differences will be interesting yeah, to see sure, when it doesn't sure. fit. Yeah, yeah sure. There, there, are, there are differences. And yes, yeah, so it's, it's definitely on, on the page and it's something that, that, that is in progress. Definitely. Okay, so, yeah. so, so I, I want to continue and ask that why I'm asking it because there are records in the world where you have uh, thick units of, of uh, evaporites, but you don't have the lake level indicators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think you can prepare something that you can then use it to reconstruct lake levels? For example, I don't know, not lake, like it was even sea levels, like for example, for the Mycenaean period, when you have only the geochemistry, but you don't have the, the lake level, yeah. the sea level yeah. indicators. Yeah. Sure, yes, I mean, for sure. Uh, I mean, typically you, you have to be careful when, when interpreting poor fluid content. Of course. But yeah. if you have um, uh, the geochemistry of, the, of, the, of fluid inclusions, for example, that can really help because you have an independent uh, record to compare to, um, and if you have geochemistry of of, of, I don't know, of sediments and compare that, then then you can get an idea if there's been reworking of the pore fluids. And if there hasn't been reworking, then you can really do what you what you said. You can use the pore fluids to do these reconstructions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. I, I will answer just a bit that next semester we have a speaker actually that is going to talk about that. I'm checking if he agreed. Yes, he agreed to talk. So I will send, this is next semester. So I will, I will um, send you the invitation also, Ilan, to participate. Okay. They are also, they were also involved in the, in the ICDP of the Dead Sea. So they are going to show some some results from them. Okay. Cool. Um, more questions. Mm. Well, I have a question. Yeah. You were saying about the dissolution of sulfate as um, um, for the LGM, but I wonder I wonder what happened when uh, the lake level was lower than the seal connecting the northern basin from the southern basin that yeah. Ravital did in one of, of the papers. Um, so if the two basins are disconnected, how do you get sulfate from the sodom that appear basically dissolved into the northern basin? That's a good question. Um, actually, what I showed you were results from the last glacial period, and yeah. that's, and we know from that time interval um lake levels were in excess of uh, the, the sill and the diaper itself so uh, we didn't really look at uh, we don't think that there was much contribution to be honest uh, following that when when the lake level dropped below the sill um i i don't i cannot quantify how much contribution from mount storm occurred uh, after the lake level did drop so the holocene period i guess um, but uh, um, but yeah, perhaps there was some contribution. Perhaps this is a parameter for the you know when you go old uh, when you go in back in time to the older formations, and then perhaps this is a parameter for understanding southern sources of humidity. I mean, I don't know. 
Uh, yes, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, do you mean by direct uh, dissolution? So from yeah. rainfall on the, the mountain? Whatever is, yeah, solving. Maybe, there in maybe the yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting. That's raising a question. Hmm. Okay, I have other questions, but um, I, I don't want to fill, to fill the time. Also, you know, we are over an hour. So if somebody else have a question, just get in because I don't see all the faces here. Um, what? Ne ne yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to, first of all, Ilan, really, really interesting talk. I mean, it's so, um, you know, it's interesting to see this such a comprehensive view and and I want to thank you you know for the students who are listening especially the first year students that's really wonderful that you shared how a question at a poster led you down the road <laughs> towards uh, a lot of research questions because sometimes I think especially in with posters and the first couple of conferences when people are presenting posters um, it's such a great opportunity to have more in-depth conversations and uh, I think you gave a really, really excellent example of that. So I just wanted to point that out and, and thank you for sharing that and hoping the students are listening to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Okay, so Elon, if you, if you want, I can also uh, add you to the list of um, to our seminar list, uh, if you if you want, or you yeah would... yeah that, that's great. I'd love that. <laughs> okay, great. Because next next week we are going from Germany to Portugal. <laughs> okay. We like presenting the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> 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 okay. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.